Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our series of Eno Center for Transportation webinars. Today, we're discussing local option transportation sale ta sales taxes with Marty Wax and Jeremy Marks. Marty Wax is the founding director of the Institute for of Transportation Studies at the University of and the universe at the University of California Transportation Center. And Jeremy Marks is a public administration analyst at UCLA's Institute of Transportation Studies, where he recently completed a master's degree in urban and regional planning with a concentration in transportation policy and planning. California counties have held nearly 100 elections over the last four decades to consider imposing local option sales taxes to fund transportation projects. And Marty and Jeremy have created a major database of all of these measures. Uh, this webinar will review the history of these measures, their characteristics, political implications, and how counties balance accountability to voters against the need for flexibility to meet changing conditions. Marty and Jeremy will also explain how you can access and use this database for research um, and other purposes. Um, so we're very excited to uh, dig into all this data and all of these insights from over 40 years of sales tax elections. As a reminder, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. You can enter them into the question box on the side of your screen at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can after the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Marty and Jeremy. So I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, this is our title slide, which repeats the previous one. So can, let's move right on to the next. Um, what we're gonna do today uh, is shown by these bullet points. We're going to talk about why local option sales taxes are important. We're going to describe the California experience with local option sales taxes for transportation. And we're going to summarize findings from really now almost four decades of research. We've been following their development since they started in the 1970s. And we're going to introduce you to a database that we've uh, created that is available to you to use if, if it serves your needs in any way. Uh, and we'll talk about different ways you might use it. And then the, uh, we'll end with a period of time for questions, answers, and discussions. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously the reason that local option sales taxes are important is that res financial responsibility for transportation has been devolving to local governments, and in particular counties, uh, for quite some time. The graph at the right shows um, in orange uh, the responsibility of state and local government for funding transportation, and in blue, the federal government, and you see the gap growing over time. Congress increased the federal gas tax roughly eight times, or exactly eight times between 1956 and 1993, roughly every four or five years, but then there's been no uh, federal gas tax increase since 1993. And it was 17% of the price at the pump in 1993, and now it's 8% of the price at the pump. And vehicles are becoming more fuel efficient. So uh, fuel tax revenue, the principal source of federal support and a major source of state support is decreasing rapidly. And so we're turning to these local option taxes as um, um, as an alternative as inflation and increased miles per gallon slow down the revenue that we collect uh, from users in relation to their driving. Next slide, please. Uh, and in California, at least, the pie chart shows that local governments are the largest share, 46%, and this is before the passage of, of the new uh, sales tax, the, the new transportation tax law that passed in 2017 went into effect gradually. It's taking effect now. So this is just, this isn't right up to the minute, but but be, before the current tax increase was imposed, 16 billion came from local sources, 12 billion a year from state sources, and 7 billion a year from federal sources in California. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. So um, many jurisdictions across the country are participating in um, the passage of, uh, of propositions that uh, increase uh, taxes for transportation. 
And this shows, this slide shows just an amazing uh, number. And also the, 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 the relative popularity of these. So looking at over several years, um, you know, as many as in, in, during the 2018 election, when there was a national election and therefore a higher turnout, and many local governments chose to put their measures on the ballot when there's a high turnout at a national election. There were 185 across the whole country. 142 of them were approved and only 43 defeated. I, I won't read all the numbers on this slide, but you see that there's a pattern. And the pattern is that most of them are approved and that there are higher numbers in high turnout national elections. Uh, next slide, please. And California has a particularly long history of local option transportation sales taxes at, um, uh, at the polls. Uh, and that traces back to Proposition 13 approved by the voters in 1978. Until that time, local money for transportation came mainly from property taxes, real estate taxes. But that um, proposition limited the increase annually in property taxes uh, to 2% and reduced property taxes to begin with. So since then, we've had a dearth of opportunities to increase the contributions from local governments to property taxes. The Howard Jarvis Tax Association, which promoted that measure, said that there's been a 57% reduction in property tax revenue in relation to what it would otherwise be had, to, had Proposition 13 not occurred. So that's the background. That's really the principal motivation for the rise in local option sales taxes. They substitute for a great deal of lost revenue, lost from property taxes. These are all voter approved. Um, most of the measures include a specific expenditure plan. These are the projects that will be funded if you vote for this. Sometimes they're operating funds, sometimes they're capital. They're probably in most cases a mix in most counties of, of capital and operating funds. Um, and the, the expenditures, the important thing is the expenditures are enumerated in the measures. Most of the measures have fixed sunset dates and we'll talk about their length, uh, 20 years, 30 years. And then if you want to continue them, they go back before the voters to be, quote, reauthorized or extended in time. And many of them have accountability provisions, review committees, annual audits, to make sure that what the politicians promise the voters they're gonna get, they actually do get. And many of them have limits on the frequency with which they can be amended or changed uh, because they want to com commit to the voters that what the voters vote for is what they're actually gonna get. And a very important point is that these are all administered locally by county transportation commissions. And interestingly, in, what, in a number of surveys, the voters have said, we don't like um, Caltrans or the federal government deciding what's done in our county. We like these measures in part because we vote on them, because they're ours and they're local. Next slide, please. Uh, it is true that sales taxes are Regressive. Regressive is a term that um, is sometimes taken pejoratively. Regressive simply means, the, the actual definition means that as income um, increases, the proportion of one's income that is expended in this tax decreases. So it falls more heavily as a percentage of total income on lower income people. Uh, that doesn't mean it's bad necessarily, because if the benefits of the uh, taxation are accrue to the lower income people, the, uh, the general effect could be very beneficial. But lost local option sales taxes are regressive. But on the other hand, so are almost all transportation taxes. And the gasoline tax, for example, is similarly regressive. It's a higher proportion of lower income people's income than of upper income people. Uh, but you could say that because a gasoline tax is paid by users of the transportation system when they use it in proportion to their use, that mitigates the regressiveness of it some somewhat. And, and sales taxes are paid by people who don't even use the transportation system, or whether you use it a lot or a little, 
it's a transaction when you buy a shirt or or or, or some other item uh, that isn't particularly related to transportation. So some people have said that that local option sales taxes are quote doubly regressive, and it's important therefore to be concerned about the equitability of the expenditure plans. Do they help lower income people as well as upper income people? Next slide, please. Now, um, in about 1997, there was a change in California law, literally in the constitution, that requires that these measures be approved by a two thirds majority. So that vertical dot dashed line shows the, uh, to the left, uh, the before two thirds was required and only a simple majority was required and the after. And notice that they are still very popular. Before, when a simple majority was re required before 1997, um, virtually all of them passed. Um, the blue it, it indicates the number in a particular year that passed, the yellow, the number that were on the ballot which failed. And you do see that there was less success after a two-thirds requirement, but they were still very popular. The next slide sort of shows that, I think. The next slide, please, Jeremy. Yeah, so the lower dashed line is a 50-50 vote. The higher dashed line is two-thirds of the vote. Each vertical bar is a measure, and uh, there are you know, the years and the counties are shown in relatively small print. But the important thing is that the blue represents those who voted in favor and the yellow, those who opposed, the proportion of the total vote that was in favor or opposed. And notice that even among those which failed to get two thirds, quite a large proportion did get more than a, a simple majority. So these measures actually are considered quite um, uh, popular, despite the fact that we live in a state that is, some people say, an anti-tax state. It's actually a relatively highly taxed state, but it, it might be more accurate to say that there's an anti-tax mood, as indicated by Proposition 13. Next slide, please. So before 1995, 19 measures had been proposed, 18 of which were successful. Since 19, 1995, with the two-thirds majority required, 64 measures have been proposed. And these numbers are important because in our database, we actually include all the past and, and failed measures. So the reason for me mentioning this is to lead up to what Jeremy will talk about later. There are quite a few measures in our database. But since 1995, eight failed to get even a simple majority. 23 got a majority of the votes in favor, but failed because they didn't get a supermajority. But 34 received two thirds of the vote and were enacted. And some of those have expired, but most of them are still uh, in effect. We'll, we'll show you the uh, more information about that in a moment. Next slide, please. So in order to design these measures to win, and they are in, in general winning, um, there are some strategies that are generally undertaken. The first is to spread the money around geographically within the county. Make sure that every city, every constituency, every area of the county gets some project. Another is to address all modes. Make sure that highways get some, or rail, or bikes, or pedestrians, ferries, if there are any, paratransit services for the elderly and disabled so that each constituency, people who would use and benefit from these different ones, uh, will consider supporting the measure because it provides something for them. Uh, another uh, strategy has been to spread the money over time, um, making sure that each constituency gets at least some early, some early benefit, because if it's a 30-year measure, some of the projects may actually be scheduled to be implemented in you know, year 20 or year 25, but because the money will flow constantly over a long period of time, will actually grow over time. Um, and the, the strategies include aiming uh, to get a balance between capital and operating projects. And um, it's important to note that all politics are local, and there are a few exceptions to the patterns that I'm outlining here. A few counties, for example, chose to enact a local option sales tax to fund only one project or only one mode, just public transit. 
But when we talk about you know 50 or so active measures, um, the vast majority, 48 of them, are these balanced and um, um, multimodal measures. Next slide, please. So this slide shows that um, different modes, highways, public transit, local roads, bike, pedestrian, shows the proportions of the money under the different county measures that go to those different modes. And you see that there's quite, the, the, the last column uh, in, uh, on the left um, is the range. And you see that is, some of these go from zero to 100%, meaning that counties differ a lot from one to another. But on average, they all fund some public transportation, some highways, some local roads. And um, interestingly, urban counties typically allocate a larger share of lost revenue, of sales tax revenue, to transit than transit's mode share in those counties, whereas rural counties, I guess not surprisingly, spend it mostly on local roads. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and um, Sonoma County is an illustration that if you try and don't succeed, try, try again. The years on the left are different measures that they attempted to pass and notice that they failed and they failed again and they failed again and they failed again and uh, finally passed um, because they kept adjusting the list of projects until they got, got it right, until they satisfied the voters. And that's not, uh, Sonoma County is an extreme case. Uh, that most counties didn't um, try that many times. Notice that in the year 2000, they actually tried two measures, one that had highways only and one that had rail and bus, and they both failed to get this, a super majority, though they got a simple majority. But they, by 2004, they finally succeeded. Many counties have tried twice and three times, but Sonoma is maybe a, an extreme example. Next slide, please. So one of the features, remember I said that the um, say, uh, property tax revenue it has declined dramatically. One of the features that I think is key to garnering local support is that these measures tend to return a proportion of the money to the cities and the unincorporated areas within the county for them to spend on their local needs at their discretion. And uh, each year, the, this, is, this is a summary of the proportion of the money in the measures that were put on the ballot in those years that is actually sent right back to local governments. And that's almost a direct replacement for the lost property tax revenue. And that illustrates how important local support is for gaining countywide approval of, of these measures and how important the so-called local return, the you know, giving back some of the money collected to local governments is in actually making these programs work. Next slide. Um, this slide summarizes that the number of years uh, during which a tax is levied and uh, as you see, 20 years and 30 years are the most common. The number of measures that have that length of time are shown at the top of each bar in the bar chart uh, in the histogram. And uh, there are some uh, that, that are only, you know, eight years, 10 years, 15 years, but the vast majority last for 20 to 30 years. And only a small number uh, in Los Angeles County and in Santa Clara County are permanent. Almost all the others have a sunset date. They, they end after 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, and in a few cases, 40 years. And that's another feature that makes them popular. The voters know that if they don't like the measure, um, it will expire, and then they'll get a chance to vote again on to whether or not to extend it or to renew it. Next slide. Um, one of the biggest challenges uh, is to balance accountability with flexibility. If a measure is going to be in place for 20 years or 30 years, some projects that were approved, that, that were listed in the expenditure plan, may get canceled because of environmental um, reviews failing, or they may get replaced by a new plan, a new planned facility in a, um, in a, in a transportation improvement plan. 
So you, you, you don't want to approve projects that we built 30 or 40 years into the future without the capacity to change those projects if you need to, but you at the same time want to assure the voters that you're not just going to spend the money in any old way, given that they've approved the money and local, and, and there is criticism that some local officials will spend the money as they see fit, regardless of what they promised in the measure. So these measures have a variety of provisions to require review and reports to the public to make sure that you're complying, like annual financial audits, the existence of citizen oversight committees, um, requiring multiple approvals to if there is going to be an amendment. So if the County Transportation Authority wants to eliminate a project that was approved by the voters, often it requires a two-thirds vote of the members of the uh, authority plus a two-thirds vote of at least two-thirds of all the city councils in the county. So the, you, there's a pretty high hurdle put in the way of just changing the expenditure plan, yet it has to be, there has to be a provision to allow it to change. And, and the, some of the provisions that do allow flexibility are that some measures provide for tiers of projects. They say, you know, this is the first priority project. This is a second, this is a third. Some allow substitution within a geographic area. North County can substitute one road project for another. Um, some allow substitution within categories. You can substitute one capital project for another, but not operations. Some measures allow substitutions within modes. You can allow one transit project to replace another transit project, but you can't take transit money and spend it on highways. They're all different, but they all balance in some way um, this notion of credible commitment, um, keeping your promise is another word of putting it, uh, requiring accountability versus flexibility. The next slide shows, um, for example, the language, the next slide, Jeremy, that shows the language that is from Merced County for the Citizens Oversight Committee, this is rather typical. You know, one representative of an ethnic community, one representative of bicyclists, one representative of the business community, one representative of the um, environmental community. And, and, and so those people get to meet once or twice a year to review the expenditure plans to certify that the expenditures are within the bounds of what was promised. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, do you want this one, Marty? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so these measures don't pass just because they're inherently popular. There's a whole industry of consultants. Public officials have learned by trial and error, as you saw in Sonoma County. Uh, measures are, in some cases, uh, imitations of other measures that have that have uh, been approved, um, and does what one do, do does what one has to do to achieve a supermajority of votes be what is in the best interest of transportation in the county well that's a trade off that everybody has to consider the revenue is needed and some projects have to be included because of their popularity even if transportation officials would rather have another project often a large capital project in their own district. Um, and do voters understand the carefully, and do they carefully consider the complex mix of projects? And you know, voters are, may vote on the basis, well, there's gonna be local return. My, my community is gonna get a certain amount of money. Or, and, and yet, um, the fact that we as transportation professionals may not think that the mix of projects is ideal we trade off what we consider less than an ideal mix to get the money, to get the voters to approve the measures. Next slide, and I'll give just one last example before turning over to, to Jeremy. Um, here's an example of what I mean when I say that the, the existence of these local option sales tax creates a new kind of transportation politics. In three particular counties that I'm familiar with, Riverside, Orange, and San Diego, all in Southern California, the early measures that were put on the ballot were all really actively opposed by environmentalists. The Sierra Club, the Natural Resources 
Defense Council and other organizations opposed them because they thought that building new roads destroys the environment and that uh, what we should do is, you know, encourage everybody to use public transit and bicycle. Um, but in later measures, the people putting these measures on the ballot and needing two thirds majority um, realized that they weren't going to get the same turnout for two thirds of uh, approval from environmentalists unless they did something to respond to the environmentalist interests. So they provided money in later measures to acquire land in, in habitat conservation measures to mitigate the transportation impacts on the environment and to comply with the endangered species. And lo and behold, especially in Riverside County, that was the first one uh, with a large amount of money uh, to fund the acquisition of, of uh, habitat for conservation as mitigation for highway projects, environmental groups encouraged their members to vote for these measures and they were approved. So transportation advocates in some cases say, we, we don't want to protect the kangaroo rat habitat with transportation money. We're not against protecting them, but, but you know, this is money that should go for, for the building of roads. But they've had to accept that trade-off in order to get the two-thirds majority. And environmentalists are very pleased that money is now available for things like habitat conservation through taxes that are primarily for transportation. So these local option sales taxes have definitely affected um, uh, transportation politics in California, e to the extent that even now there's a, in, in the new uh, uh, SB1 ga uh, gasoline tax money, there is actually a large environmental protection fund that has been included in statewide legislation as a basis of what's been learned from local um, uh, sales taxes. Now I think it's time to turn it over to Jeremy, who's going to tell you about the fact that we have created a database. All this information that I've been giving you, to, uh, giving to you, is available measure by measure, uh, phrase by phrase, and it's free to download from the internet. And you can use it uh, for research or for teaching if you're an academic or you can use it when you're designing your own local option sales tax to learn from our experience. So now Jeremy uh, will uh, complete our presentation by telling you more about our database. Yes, and I hope everyone um, can hear me. Thank you so much, Marty, for that uh, wonderful and, and wide-ranging overview um, of, of local option sales taxes in California. So as Marty mentioned, um, we have pulled together a, a, what we're calling a loss to database. These are on county-level loss measures in California, um, and it includes information on all of the, all of the measures uh, by our count, 86, that have uh, passed or failed uh, but been brought to the voters in California since about 1976 um, in the course of, of a number of research efforts that were led out of uh, the Institute of Transportation Studies at UCLA that are focused on these loss measures. Uh, myself, Marty, and other researchers uh, have looked at things like um, amendment procedures and, and public accountability in loss measure implementation as well as um, you know, equity uh, in how these funds are distributed. And in the course of some of the more recent research into loss, we, I, I sort of noticed that, um, you know, there, there isn't necessarily one um, compendium of information on loss measures across all counties that uh, researchers and policymakers can turn to um, for, for sort of detailed information. So we, we tried to pull this together and sort of as we were as we were gathering information, we figured it would be um, valuable to, to put it all in one place and then make that available too other researchers and to policymakers. Um, so we hope that uh, we hope that this will be useful. So the information contained in the database falls into a number of discrete categories. Um, the first uh, segment, just basic measure information contains uh, data on how, uh, how long each measure um, is effective for, the rate of each tax, uh, which authority is in charge of implementing each loss, sort of the nature of each measure, so whether it's uh, the first in a county or an extension or a renewal of a previous measure, we have information on the percent of yes votes, um, as well as how much revenue is expected to be generated. Um, then we have a series of data points on each measure related to um, how lost funds are proposed to be expended across different funding categories uh, by percentages. And we also uh, provide links to the original measure expenditure plans for those uh, 
for those expenditure plans that we could find. Um, so we, we hope that that will be really valuable as well. You can click through and we've hosted them on uh, on a box website for you to peruse and download at your convenience. Um, then there's a section on local return, which Marty alluded to earlier. So for each measure, what percent of the funding is dedicated to to be returned to local um, municipalities for use uh, at their discretion. Um, and then we have a section uh, labeled other that pertains to um, loss measure amendment procedures. So what are the circumstances under which uh, an ordinance or an expenditure plan can be amended um, from the version that was originally pr uh, proposed to voters. We also have hyperlinks that link to the original measure ordinances um, also hosted on box. And there's a section of sort of um, political considerations. So how was the ballot question presented to voters for each measure? What, what were the arguments for and against each measure as well as the political um, supporters and opponents? And then finally, a section uh, pertaining to sort of public accountability and oversight. So we give information on, um, you know, a number of the measures have independent citizens oversight committees that are charged with um, overseeing implementation on behalf of the public. So we have the names of those committees, um, information on how they've been composed and their responsibilities, as well as uh, what auditing requirements pertain to each measure, either fiscal or performance-based auditing. So I'll quickly just overview, um, and I apologize for the small font here, but I've just taken some screenshots to avoid having to scroll through the physical um, uh, spreadsheet live, um, some screenshots of the database to just give you a sense of the kind of information that's contained in here. Um, and so anything you see here that is underlined, that's actually a hyperlink. So we've tried to link to the original um, source uh, for the information in any given cell so that you can click through and, and see for yourself. But here is a basic information section. Um, and here are a few examples of the information contained in the project lists and expenditure plan section. We've got uh, percentage funding allocations by funding category. Um, you know, some of this took a lot of digging and a little bit of interpretation at times, but we've done our best to sort of synchronize um, synchronize our analysis across different measures. Um, and uh, sorry, and here you can see one uh, example of a measure that dedicates 100% of funding uh, to transit here in the third row down um, measure Q. So, so as Marty mentioned, some measures sort of try to spread their, their funding across different categories. Some measures um, dedicate 100% to local return or 100% to um, transit or highways. Here's a, a sampling of what's contained in the ballots support and opposition section. Um, the, uh, the ballot question and ballot text is, is, is included. And again, anything that's underlined, you can click through. and It'll link you to uh, the website uh, where we've sourced the information. And then finally, and I apologize again for the really small font here, but um, this should give you a sense of how much information we were able to pack into this database. Uh, and these columns have to do with the independent citizens oversight committee that I mentioned previously. So we really hope this will be useful to, to other researchers to kind of get a running start if you're interested in looking only at local return or, or perhaps only at auditing. Um, you know, this will help you streamline, uh, streamline your research there. So I've provided a link to the uh, event organizers today who have um, who will be making that available to attendees, and, and we hope that uh, we hope that it'll be useful. And if you have any questions uh, pertaining to the database, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is listed here, um, or Marty, who can help uh, connect you to me. Or, and um, yeah. Oh, and I should note as well, there are a number of fields that are marked as as missing, either because you know we we weren't able to access um, a measures ordinance or expenditure plan, or you know just weren't able to find that information online. So if anyone um, using the database finds that they have insight into uh, some of those missing fields, uh, we would encourage you to reach out to us. This will be a, a constantly, I think, evolving product. But um, yeah, we see this as as, as one point out, but we hope it'll be useful um, in the interim. So with that, I will stop and. Uh, Unless Marty has any concluding remarks, we can open it up. Questions. Thank you, Bill. I think it's time for questions and comments and reactions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you so much to both of you. This was incredibly fascinating. Lots of data and history to dig in here. And I hope the folks on the line will um, go in, dig into this database, um, and you know, add to this um, body of knowledge on uh, ballot measures um, and some of their applications. So we have a couple of questions, a mix of um, some technical ones about variables that um, you capture in the database um, and some broader ones, um, obviously about the pandemic 
Um, and so I'll save those for the end. But to start off with some of the ones about specific variables, we had a couple of questions about turnout. Um, I, from what I understood, I don't believe turnout is um, something that was modeled in this database or collected. But in your in the process of collecting data, did you come across turnout numbers? Um, and you know, have you found any correlation between turnout and um, either measure passage or failure rate? Uh, in uh, fact, uh, did you want to answer, Jeremy? Go ahead, start with the data, and then I'll I'll comment after that. Okay. Uh, yeah, turnout is not something that that, that we've tracked in the database, um, and uh, and I'm not sure it's a data point that is. I'm sure it's readily available, um, and it would it would certainly be interesting to look and see if there's a correlation there. But it's not something we tracked. Um, and when I mentioned earlier that this is sort of 1.0 of the database, and that it'll be constantly evolving, you know, these are the kinds of suggestions that uh, that we're very open to hearing. And um, you know, that's that's something that we could add in, or you can download the database yourself as well. Um, and if that's something you're interested in looking at, uh, I think that would be great, Marty. Please. Uh, the point I was going to make is that um, the um, data on turnout would not be a random sample because the people designing these measures in many cases um, are uh, choosing to place them on, on the ballot when they expect a large turnout. And the turnout uh, is correlated, therefore, with the frequency or the number of measures. Um, and and they, they're consciously put on, on the ballot when there's a national election. And, and withheld from the ballot when it's a, only a local election because of the higher turnout. And the last point of, about that I'll make is that there's a higher correlation with one's political affiliation than with whether one is a driver or uh, whether, you're li whether you live in a suburb or a dense inner city. And Democrats tend to vote for these measures in much higher proportions than Republicans. And California is an increasingly democratic state which is in part the explanation for the popularity of these measures. Great point. And that feeds into another question we got about, you know, whether the elections in these um, in the database are sorted um, by their date. So whether it's in the spring primary or in the general election, um, and even if it's not, have you noticed any trend? I mean, you mentioned um, that, you know, you obviously see much higher turnout um, you know, in the November general election, especially during a presidential year. But did you notice any kind of clustering or patterns in, you know, uh, in terms of dates and elections? Uh, I, I do. Um, and the earliest measures in the 1970s were not attentive to that. So some of them, you know, they, they appeared on the ballot when they were ready, um, when, when the coalitions got together and got their uh, petitions done and got them filed. And as time went by, they became more clustered in national elections in even numbered years. Some of the earliest ones appeared on primary ballots or when there were only local elections. Um, but more recently, they appear when there's a senatorial, gubernatorial, or presidential election. Interesting. Um, kind of going back to, um, you know, the, the database, uh, you, you've talked a bit about, you know, patterns we saw in different regions of California, um, and, you know, obviously the, the region is captured in the database. Have you seen any patterns in terms of which regions in California are, you know, putting the most measures on the ballot, um, and did you run any kind of geographic analysis, you know, either by county or municipality or Northern California versus Southern California? Jeremy, you, uh, you're welcome to join in. I, I, I'm kind of monopolizing the responses. My, my response would be that there, there is a pattern, but it's modal. That is, urban and dense suburban counties do have a, a focus on public transit, and the rural counties obviously focus on, on, on local roads. Um, but there is no um, sort of I wouldn't say that the that the measure that having a measure is more common in an urban or suburban or rural area. They appear in all regions of the state, coastal and inland, north and south, um, and urban and, and rural. 
Mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I might actually differ a little bit from your response, Marty. I think that um, if you look at the counties that have multiple measures, uh, certainly multiple active measures, but but also um, just a history of having multiple past loss measures that may have um, expired. I think you know LA County, I believe, currently has the most with four yeah. um, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and I think anecdotally, I don't have the database in front of me, uh, but you know, I think. In general, more rural counties uh, tend to have fewer measures um, than urban counties. Uh, but yeah, this is per the kind county, of thing that per, per county, yes, that, per county. I, I think I agree with that. And and you know, it, it's important to note that LA County ha, is the uh, most populous county in the whole United States, and it, it and it has about half the population of the whole state. And it has been more reliant on local option sales taxes than any other county in the state. That's a, right, that's with, a, with with more than 50%, uh, I believe, of LA Metro, uh, the county transportation agency's budget coming from local auction sales tax revenues, um, which is somewhat of an outlier, if I'm not mistaken, Marty. That, that That's right, though, it, though, you know, the San Benito County also has measures and a substantial proportion of revenue as well. It, it's a matter, of, I think it, I would respond to that point by saying it's a matter of scale. LA is just so much bigger. It has more measures, more money, more people, more transit, and more roads. Mm -hmm. And and but it, but there is definitely a presence in rural counties. The fact what you said is right. I think there are more in urban counties, but there's more of everything in urban counties. Got it. So two more questions before um we uh wrap up and be mindful of everyone's time. Um, we had a, a viewer ask um, whether there's been any movement towards reverting the simple majority uh, or reverting back to the supermajority threshold. Um, you know, it appears from the data that, you know, a lot of these measures do cross the threshold, but the supermajority requirement um, appears to be, at least from the, that graph you showed, uh, potentially a limiting factor. And if, is it, would it even be politically feasible um, to revert back? Well, the, the, a very direct answer to that question is that um, a, a couple of members of the state legislature introduced a bill to require a 55% supermajority rather than a two-thirds, 66 and two-thirds percent supermajority, and it didn't it didn't pass the legislature. So there has been a movement, you could say, in response to that question, but it hasn't been successful. And um, I would also note we've seen a couple of examples. Um, uh, one of which was in Santa Clara County and, and was challenged and I believe upheld uh, of of counties putting forth sort of two measures at at once. One being an advisory measure saying, um, if any new uh, the taxes are passed, we would want the revenues to be dedicated to this list of transportation projects. And then a second measure at the same election. Um, that 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 is posed as a general tax as opposed to a special tax, meaning it wouldn't be uh, subject to the two-thirds supermajority requirement. Um, so that that's sort of a way that we've seen counties getting around that in a way. Um, yeah, that was Santa Clara County, and it was upheld by the courts. That, that which was a surprise, but most counties have not done that. Interesting. So one last uh, parting question before we wrap up. Of course, the coronavirus pandemic is on everyone's mind, um, and uh, a lot of folks are interested, um, you know, in the future of these uh, measures. Um, kind of based on your data collection, um, how do you have you seen uh, a lot of cancellations? Are a lot of municipalities still moving ahead, um, or even just from a you know, a broader prediction point of view? How do you think some of these existing measures? Um, you know, well, Jeremy, Jeremy is collecting data on, on the decline of sales tax revenue uh, since COVID. So maybe he should go first. Sure. Um, so yeah, as Marty mentioned, we're, we're currently doing a project that's looking at just this question, uh, local option sales tax revenue declines, as well as declines in other state level funding sources for transportation. And, and what we found uh, looking at data from the first two quarters of, uh, of fiscal year 2020, 2021, is that counties um, with active loss measures in, in quarter one all reported uh, massive year-over-year -year losses, uh, massive meaning somewhere on the range of uh, 15 to 45% decline or thereabouts 
um, year over year. So comparing quarter one of this year to the to the previous year, and then in quarter two, um, all counties either reported a smaller decline than they did in Q1 uh, year over year, or uh, actually an increase in lost revenue. So we're seeing if the trend continues, and this might be due to um, federal stimulus that that has um, you know more or less expired at this point. Um, so we'll see what Q3 has has in store, but uh, we're seeing lost revenues sort of rebound pretty dramatically, um, and in some cases actually increase year over year in quarter two. Um, and then just uh, on the political question in terms of uh, counties withdrawing uh, proposed measures from the ballot, we I've heard of at least one example. And I think it was in Sacramento County of of the county opting to actually pull a measure uh, off of the ballot. So so they're not um, they were at, at one point planning to put it before voters um, this November, and, and now they've, just, they've decided not to, uh, presumably due to COVID. Exactly. I have nothing to add. That, that that was a complete answer. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. And that definitely sounds like a very interesting project, and we'll look forward to you know, seeing those findings. Um, so thank you again, uh, Jeremy and Marty, uh, for joining us, for sharing your database, um, and for sharing some of your insights, again, on you know 40 years worth of measures. Um, we really appreciate you volunteering your time. And um, again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, as usual, you can subscribe to our emails and notifications and stay up to date on uh, upcoming webinars. Um, and just as a plug, you know, Eno also um, keeps track of uh, ballot measures across the country. And so as we move forward towards election day, um, you can look forward to more coverage about ballot measures um, and uh, their their impacts and their uh, outcomes as we get closer to November. So thank you again for joining us. I uh, hope everyone's staying safe and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.